that it is my pleasure to tell you a little bit about tonight's speaker. Dr. John Cassiopo got his PhD at The Ohio State University in 1977. And for the last 35 years, he has become the leading figure in the area of neuroscience. He's published hundreds of articles on all topics of the mind, body, brain relationship. Receives countless awards from the National Academy of Sciences, among others. And he has become the primary figure, a leader in neuroscience. During those same 35 years, he has managed to become the leading voice in the area of social psychology, a very different discipline within psychology, which, and, and, and an area that typically has no overlap with the neuroscientists. And again, he has hundreds of articles and dozens of awards, and has become a leading figure in that area as well. Somehow now, in the last few years, he's found some time to combine these two fields into a single unified science. And he'll talk to you about that tonight. And it's a very exciting area to do social neuroscience. And he'll talk to you today about the importance of bringing those two fields together. And so as we go, as you listen tonight, and this is especially for the students in the audience, I think you can look to Dr. Cassiopo as a hero, as the kind of scientist who can bring together two very discrepant fields and with that power, give us the ability to begin coping with some of the real problems of our society. It is in that context and with great pleasure that I want to introduce Dr. John Cassiopo. Thank you very much. Thank you for the wonderful introduction, Art. I want to thank Terry Bristol, ISAF, ArtCon, uh, all for their uh, making it possible for me to be here. I'd like to share with you that Portland is one of my favorite cities of the whole world, um, and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Linus Pauling would be 111, I believe, this year. He was certainly one of my scientific heroes as I grew up, and I'm sure he was one of yours, so that's an added pleasure to be here. So I'd like for you to go on a journey with me today as we look at what I'm going to describe as a social brain. Uh, everything we experience, everything we see, hear, feel, understand is a function of the operations of the human brain. So given that premise, I'd like to start with a few facts about this remarkable organ. First, the adult brain is really smaller than you might think. Uh, it weighs about three pounds. It's about five and a half inches wide, six and a half inches long, and about three and a half inches deep. Uh, the total surface area of the cerebral cortex, that barky, convoluted surface area, is about two and a half square feet. It's a remarkable covering, and it's so large only because of all the wrapping, all the convolutions that exist in it, and I'm going to come back to that. Uh, the cell bodies of the neurons vary in diameter from 4 to 100 microns. The human brain has about 100 billion such neurons, each of which typically forms 1,000 to 10,000 connections or synapses, forming approximately 10 to the 14th channels of information transfer. Now, when you think about that, those 10 to the 14th channels of information transfer make an almost infinite number of connections and patterns possible. And that's really what underlies uh, our thought and behavior, our feelings, our desires, our aspirations. Now, the neurosciences have been brought together. It's a many different sciences to study the structure and function of the central nervous system and the brain. This is such a broad question, a challenging enterprise, that there's basic sciences, clinical sciences, and applied sciences. You can kind of break them down into two basic sets. The largest set looks at the structure of the central nervous system and brain, and that can fall into molecular, cellular, or more integrative uh, levels of analysis. There's a second, of course, and that's those that look at the function of the brain and central nervous system. And one of the oldest is behavioral neuroscience, and it looks at basic evolutionary or behavioral phenomena, motivation, homeostasis, sleep, biological rhythms. You see these in human and non-human animals. 
About 20 years ago, a second perspective, functional perspective, was introduced, and that is cognitive neuroscience. And in cognitive neuroscience, basically you look at the brain as if it were a computer. And as soon as I say that, you realize you start asking different questions. Where's the storage device? Where's RAM? Where's ROM? How big is each? How do they operate? What's the representational system? And so indeed, you have topics of study like attention, like perception, memory systems, and reasoning. 20 years ago this year, there was a third perspective, functional perspective, that was introduced, and that is social neuroscience. Social neuroscience, basically, instead of looking at the brain like an individual solitary computer, you look at it as a mobile broadband connected device connected to other brains, to other computers. And you, as soon as I say that, you know, you start to ask different kinds of questions. You ask, for instance, where's the Wi-Fi card in this? You look at language and you don't think of it as a representational system that allows you to talk to yourself. Instead, you think of it as a means of communicating, as connecting at a distance with other brains. And so, of course, the topics that are of study here, these are just illustrative, attachment, attraction, aggression, communication, empathy, theory of mind, I could go on and on. And this is what we're going to focus on. No one of these is better than the other. We need to take all of these perspectives to understand brain function and brain structure. That structure is revealed. The organizations are revealed when you actually start to look at these functions. We talk sometimes about what's directly connected to what inside the brain. The truth is, you don't have to go very many synapses and you have basically the whole brain connected to each other. And so it's important that we use these functional approaches so that we see how are these structures actually connected so that they form functioning holes. When we look at the, the central nervous system, people talk about the brain, but really what they mean is the brain and the spinal cord because this is our processing organ. We see that it's organized in a, what's called a heterarchical fashion. What is a heterarchy? Well, if I think about stairs, they're a hierarchy. I don't get to the third floor without going through the second. If I think about elevators, similarly, I have stops at every floor, but in some buildings, they have express elevators, right? So I can go to every floor, but I can also just skip. Well, that's a heterarchical organization. And that's how, in fact, the central nervous system is organized. And I'll just give you an illustration. Just at the spinal cord level, you don't need anything beyond uh, three neurons, two synapses, to be able to touch something painful and withdraw your hand from that painful stimulus. Perhaps you've done this. I, I'm a klutz. I've certainly cooked sometimes. I reach out and I touch the stove, a very hot plate, and I pull back that hand. And as I'm pulling back the hand, I realize what I've done and I think, what an idiotic thing to have done. All right? Well, the reason I'm pulling back the hand before I even have that thought is that thought took the sensory information to go all the way to the brain and for that information, that thought, to now have time to be generated, make sense of what happened, and articulate it to myself. But that reflex is already being promoted by this very short reflex art, protective reflex art. Now, it doesn't mean that I can't introduce something to influence that reflex. Uh, usually these systems, and I just gave you two, there's multiple, usually these systems work synergistically. You approach things that you like, and that's true at both levels. You avoid things you dislike, and so they don't um, run in opposition. But they can. They can. You might have something that's painful. Perhaps a physician is coming to you with a, with a shot that will save your life. Well, in that particular case, you aren't going to run off, although you might entertain such thoughts, but you will sit there and take that shot because it's actually going to help you heal. Well, in that case, you have a reflex arc that wants to withdraw and a rostral, a frontal cortex, that's resisting that, that's inhibiting that withdrawal response. And so you sit, you take the shot, and you're healed as a result. All right? So there's a case of opposition or interference between the two. Another such case, and you get this kind of differences as you go up these levels of organization, is uh, when I reach out, I touch, say, a, a wall that's on fire, I immediately reflexively withdraw my hand, and then I hear my child on the other side of that wall say, Daddy, I'm scared. Well, who in this audience wouldn't put up with the pain and push through that wall to get to their child, to help that child escape the flames? But what the, what the brain can do the frontal cortex can do, that the spinal cord reflex cannot do, is it looks around and it notices that there's a door that's not on fire that allows you to move through, get behind the wall to the child so that both of you ex can escape the fire without damage to either. As you go from these caudal, 
lower mechanisms to rostral, higher mechanisms. You get enhanced response flexibility. I can consider what I might do. I don't simply withdraw my hand. You get greater contextual control. If the door is on the left, if the door is on the right, it doesn't matter. I can enter the door to get the child. But it is slower. It's more serial-like. So it's this combination of influences that you actually see underlying human behavior. Let me give you an experimental illustration in chimpanzees. This is Sally Boyson. This is, um, that's Bobby. Uh, Bobby was one of the chimps that we use. These chimps are special in the sense that Sally has been working with them for many, many years, and she has taught them Arabic numerals. So they can identify uh, these digits. They know what they mean. They can add. They can do translative inference. So if I put two plates of candies, these little dots are supposed to illustrate candies. Chimps love candies. They would, the chip would be able to tell you that this represented four and this digit represented two elements in that plate. All right? Now, in this particular study, what we did was to put the plates in front of the chimp. Now, I might tell you that chimps are very powerful animals. So we put them in front of the chimp, but there's also a thick glass between the chimp and the plates. Otherwise, the chimp would simply take all the candies in front of it. Uh, and it has learned to point to the plate, all right? And all the food transfer is through a drawer uh, beneath the glass, all right? So the task here is to point to one of the two. And whatever plate the animal points to, they get the candies in the other plate. It's called the reverse contingency task. It's a kind of evil task that psychologists like to develop. All right? And what we found was that uh, Bobby and all the other chimps, trial after trial, day after day, pointed more often to the large array of candies rather than the small array. Now, these numbers varied from one to six, and they varied in which side of the plate and the, number, the disparity between the two plates. But the chimp wanted the candies, and again and again, more often than chance, here's the data, pointed to the larger plate. So the chimp continually received the smaller number of candies. I can tell you these chimps were not happy about that, and they let us know it. So here we have evidence that the chimps were, were really incredibly stupid, couldn't learn the task, right? No. In fact, what we also saw was order in their data. They made errors, not randomly, but systematically. The larger the plate of candies, the more likely they were to make the error. The bigger the discrepancy between the two plates, the more likely they were to make the error. In fact, when we used that simple rule, we accounted for 94% of the chimps' errors. Any of the psychologists sitting out here, you know that is the highest I have ever been able to predict any primate behavior. All right? It's extraordinarily high. So this chimp was learning something. It couldn't control the behavior. So the next version of the task we did was simple. We replaced the plates of candies with Arabic numerals. All right? And we performed the same task. And immediately, the chimps were above chance. This is their average level. Each block is trials within a day, hundreds of trials within a day. Each column within that is a day of training, a day of testing. All right? They immediately were performing above chance. Again, consistent with the notion that these chimps knew the rules. Now, why that difference? Well, if they had the candy there, the biological impulse is so apparent the stimulus is so salient, it's difficult for that chimp to suppress these limbic or lower regions that are controlling the behavior. When you have a symbolic representation, that distances us. It distances the brain in some ways from what it is that we really want or we're working to achieve. This Las Vegas has figured out. You don't have to work for the amount you're putting into the table or the machines, right? You use chips. They don't even let you use money. You're using chips that are distant, as distant as they can make from what you actually are, are losing while in their abode. All right? And so you see, one of the reasons that symbolic reasoning has evolved is that we, it frees us up from some of these biological impulses that otherwise would be more difficult to control. Now, there's another thing I want to link, and this is where we go back to the brain, is that this symbolic reasoning, this capacity, is directly related to these convolutions in the neocortex. And the notion is 
that as we go up the phylogenetic tree, especially in mammals, we see more and more complicated brains because more and more neocortical convolutions allow more and more cortical space to be stuffed inside a smaller cranial vault as, as can be erected. So where did these convolutions come from? What's driving them? Well, the obvious answer is ecological complexity. If I have a demanding environment that makes it hard to identify or find food or uh, to avoid predators, clearly I need a more convoluted neocortex so that I can have as much processing space as possible. There's another possibility, and it is it's not the ecological complexity, it's the social complexity. If you think about what you do on a daily basis that's really hard, really complicated, it's not math, it's not physics, it's dealing with interpersonal relationships. And so indeed that was a hypothesis. Robin Dunbar in England posited that. And these are data from Robin's lab. What he shows here is the neocortex ratio it's basically that the ratio of neocortical volume, and remember, neocortex is that cerebral bark on the outside, okay? It's the ratio of that volume to the volume of the rest of the brain. And he's plotted this by the mean group size in which the animal lives. And what you see, both in monkeys and apes, a very striking linear relationship. Now, if you do this for ecological complexity, there's no relationship at all. All right. Now, what is it about social environments that are complicated? Well, let me just list a few. You have to learn by social observation. In fact, one of the things that makes humans distinct from other species is the extent to which we do this. Other primates do this. We do it just tremendously more than any other animal. Recognizing the shifting status of friends and foes. Anticipating and coordinating efforts between two or more individuals using language to communicate, reason, teach, and yes, deceive others. Orchestrating relationships ranging from pair bonds and families to friends, bands, and coalitions. Navigating complex social hierarchies, social norms, and cultural developments. Subjugating self-interest to the interests of the, uh, the pair bond or social group in exchange for the possibility of long-term benefits, which places a premium on the capacity to self-regulate. Recruiting support to sanction individuals who violate group norms, something incredibly important if, in fact, norms are going to be maintained. And doing this across time frames that stretch from the distant past to multiple possible futures. So as you can see from this, we, in fact, have and are immersed in a very complicated social environment and one that places great use on our neocortex. It's interesting in that light that for most of the 20th century, we biological scientists, social scientists, were interested in these processes, but we studied individuals as solitary items. And we did that for good reasons. Social context is complicated. And as an experimentalist, I want to control all the variables except for the ones I'm intentionally manip manipulating. And so if I want to study something social, I can study an individual and fabricate in their mind some variable in social context. I can do that with the animal as well. Well, after doing that for 50 years or so, it's easy to forget that, in fact, these are social creatures. And by definition, they create superorganismal structures. And those structures have a neural, hormonal, cellular, and genetic base. And the way to study those is not to just study that individual. So we have across species this different, uh, these different structures. They vary in different species, but what's common is that they all are critical to the health of these organisms. And I took an approach to study what are these underlying biological processes and how important are they to the production of these connections across members of a species by using a classic approach done in the neurosciences. I'll just give you an example. If I want to study the function of a gene, what I might do is to compare a normal mouse with a knockout mouse. And what that knockout mouse is, it's the same mouse with all the same genes except the one I want to study. And it's not that I'm interested in the absence of that gene. I'm interested in the differences in the behavior or the neural processes or the endocrine processes that are produced by the knockout mouse versus the normal mouse. And the difference is 
give me clues as to what that gene's function might be. The story of Phineas Gage. This is a, a, in the 1860s, a railroad worker supervisor was using a tamping iron to set a, a dynamite charge. The tamping uh, iron uh, caused a discharge of the, of the uh, um, explosive, rocketing the tamping iron through Phineas's Gage's orbital frontal cortex, depicted here, leaving a relatively large hole. By the way, this actually knocked him back. He didn't lose consciousness. He did have an infection, but within weeks, he was healed from a medical perspective. He was never the same again. In fact, he changed his social behavior profoundly. And from that change, we learned a lot about the social functions of the orbital frontal cortex. We learned about it because of the comparison of his behavior before and after the orbital frontal cortex was decimated. So using that kind of subtractive approach, you can see where I'm going. If I want to understand what are social connections doing to brain and biology, to behavior, and to social processes, I can compare individuals who have connections and those who don't have connections. And so that's the story I'd like to unfold for you next. And what I've just displayed is a relatively awful looking graph. It was a science article by three social epidemiologists. But what I have along here is how isolated are these individuals? Low integration means they're relatively isolated. They're not married. They have very infrequent contact with friends and families. They belong to few, if any, uh, organizations, and they don't belong to church or attend church, okay, or anything like that. So they're fairly isolated from others. These are individuals who are high on all of those dimensions. And these are lines represent different studies. And what it shows is that in these various prospective studies, the more isolated are these individuals, the more likely they are to die young. So it's a predictor of broad-based morbidity and mortality. And the broad-based is a clue. It's not that they were dying more of cancer or they were dying more of heart disease. It was everything. So it suggests there's something general operating, not something specific. Now, 50 years ago, biological scientists thought social factors were relatively recent developments and therefore had little or no relevance for understanding basic structure or function of the central nervous system and brain. And even if it did, it's too complicated to understand in the next 100 years. So there was really no need to consider such factors. Social scientists were no less dismissive of the biological sciences. Having gone through two world wars, a Great Depression, and a mountain of social injustices, Social science argument was that we may understand the brain in a thousand years. We don't have a thousand years to wait. It is time now to turn to the situational factors and the policies that we might establish that will bring about better societies. And so these being social epidemiologists, they didn't interpret this in terms of any biological influence whatsoever. They posited what's called the social control hypothesis. You might think about it as the nagging hypothesis. Basically, the argument is that if you have friends and family and you're not taking very good care of yourself, you're engaged in poor health behaviors, they will nag you until you take better care of yourself. If you have no such relationships, you can get away with poor health behaviors, staying out, carousing, drinking too much, no exercise, and on and on, and that leads to an earlier death because, of course, health behaviors do determine, is a factor that determines morbidity and mortality. Now, forget the fact there was no evidence why bother with evidence when you have such a compelling story? <laughs> and I had a couple problems with this, and so we started to, uh, to look at this a little more carefully. But let me show you what's actually happening in terms of how we're living just in the United States. And as you might guess, yes, we are living more isolated lives. So what I have depicted here is the percent of one-person households in each state. And these light colors mean it's less than 15%. These colors in Nevada and Montana, 15 to 20%. And this is 1940, okay? This is 1970, and this is 2000, okay? So we have a dramatic change in the nature in which we're living. Now, not all of this is bad. I would not want to go back to this at the expense of what's accounting for this change. We're living longer. That's a good thing. We're more affluent. It used to be if 
someone, if a, if a married couple were living together and one died, especially as tends to be the case statistically, it's the husband. In 1940, that wife often had to move back with other family in order to survive. We're more affluent. And so now families or individuals are able to keep their households and live among neighbors and communities that they've grown up with. So not all of this is translating into more uh, isolation as they're feeling, but it is more isolation in terms of how we're actually living. And this objective versus perceived isolation is an important distinction. What I have mapped here in the Chasers is the Chicago Health Agent Social Relations Study. This is a longitudinal study that I began in 2001. It's a random sample of people living in Cook County, born between 1935 and 1952, and we bring them into my lab once a year. They bring with them uh, big uh, vats of overnight urine so we can do endocrine assays. They're in my lab the whole day. We test extensively during the day and then they take home test tubes and we get salivary cortisol and diaries and other data from them for the days after that. This happens every year and we're in year 11 now of that study. And this is simply a mapping of how isolated are they and how isolated do they feel. And you can see there's a rough association but it's anything but perfect. And I'll just give you a single example. There's many such examples, but I'll just give you a single example. When kids leave high school, family behind, and they go off to college, they actually go from fairly small families, maybe having a room by themselves and having had class sizes of modest uh, size, now going to a university or a college where they're living with more kids, they're perhaps sharing a room for the first time, uh, they eat among a much larger number of kids, and their class sizes are much larger and they feel terribly lonely for the first week or so. They feel isolated. You know, universities know this, they throw mixers. If you've ever been to a mixer, you know, you go there, you see other people talking, and you say, yes, it's true, I really am the only person here who knows no one. <laughs> In fact, we, we actually did this study, we asked, what's one of the predictors of how isolated these incoming kids feel? Miles from home turns out to be a significant predictor, all right? And so there's all kinds of reasons why this relationship is anything but linear. And indeed, when we do these studies, we find out that objective isolation, as soon as you put in perceived isolation, that's a much stronger prediction. Objective isolation predicts very little or nothing. And all of the effects about which I'll be speaking, objective isolation has been put in, it doesn't predict anything. The one exception is when you need access to health care, and having someone there to actually get you to the doctor or to the hospital can make the difference. But you think about how often that actually happens, and you can see that it's a very small uh, factor in the whole equation. Now, I might mention, the reason we did population-based research was because I wanted to understand our nature as humans. I can study extreme groups and find interesting effects, but that doesn't allow me to generalize to who we are as a species. And so that's the reason for the population-based research in Chicago. We've done population-based research in the United States. And we've done this in the Netherlands and now in China. So we're trying to represent uh, the species as well as we can around the world. And the, what I'll be telling you, we find operating in all the venues in which we've been able to test it. Now, you may have heard of the word loneliness. I've already used it. When we were doing this research and we were looking, we found perceived isolation to be very important, it became very apparent to us as quicker than I might want to admit that we were studying loneliness. Perceived isolation or loneliness is a gnawing chronic disease without redeeming feature was the dominant scientific view when we started this work. It was like depression or shyness or introversion. Right? In fact, all of those turn out to be wrong. Now, don't get me wrong. If I make you feel isolated, you're going to feel shyer. You will be more anxious. You will be more depressed. But they're not the same thing. These are the consequences. When we experimentally manipulate whether you are isolated or not, these things are all consequences rather than causes. The one of the differences between an introvert and an extrovert isn't so much loneliness. It's how many people do they need to feel like they have a relationship with before they no longer feel isolated. An extrovert has more if you will, social needs, more connections are needed for them to feel satisfied than an introvert. Okay, this is just a, a partial list of some of the effects we have found uh, from uh, our research on perceived isolation. Uh, higher morbidity and mortality, progression of dementia, 
This was not ours. This was actually another group in Chicago. Increased blood pressure, metabolic syndrome, increased hypothalamic pituitary activity. I'll show you some of those data. Uh, depression and diminished executive functioning. Yes, impulse control becomes more difficult when you feel isolated. So we have the same effects from this perceived isolation as the epidemiologists were talking about. Not, but remember, they argued it was due to health behaviors. Well, there was a second reason why I thought that was a dubious conclusion, and it was this research. When you look at non-human animals, you can do something quite nefarious. You can take them and you can put them in a cage all by themselves instead of a cage with conspecifics, right? And you can look at what is the effect of social isolation. We can't do that in humans. So in humans, it really depends on whether they want to be by themselves. And in fact, one of the things we have found is people who are non-lonely, people who are highly connected, know the importance of taking time away from others. So the idea that being alone means you're lonely is something I want to erase from your mind because it will contribute to you becoming lonely. Non-lonely people know the importance of having time to themselves, and that's because social interactions are demanding. And you need that energy, and you have to be able to disengage as well. So what do we find in these kinds of studies? We and others, there's actually a very large literature going back a couple decades now. This is just a sampling, decreases the lifespan in fruit flies due to oxidative stress mechanisms, exacerbates infarct size, and decreases post-stroke survival following experimentally induced strokes in mice. Indeed, you experimentally produce a stroke in a mouse that has been individually housed for two weeks prior or housed with another mouse for two weeks prior, and you look at what damage that experimental infarct does. If it's an isolated mouse, and these are clones, genetically identical mice, when you look, if it's isolated, three times the neural damage. That same experimental infarct creates three times the neural damage, and it's because of inflammation. It's because of a different inflammatory biology inside that animal. Decreases open field activity. Basically, you take a rat, and you isolate that rat, or you leave it in a group house condition, and you put it in an open field, and open field is a box and the box the animal can walk around. Typically, the rat will walk around the outside, they'll walk around the middle or back to the outside. Around the walls is the safe area, all right? The middle is dangerous. And so they'll explore, they'll go back to the wall, they'll explore, you isolate the rat, and it walks around the outside wall. It doesn't move in. It's called predator evasion. It's sitting there, it's a, living on the edge as a social animal is dangerous. If you've ever seen a National Geographic film, you know this to be the case, right? And so these animals' brains know this. I'm not saying the animals know this. The brains of these animals know this. And it's operating accordingly in that environment. And so you see some of the others. The cortisol is higher as well. OK, the third. This is our study. We looked in the Health and Retirement Survey. This is a nationally representative survey done in the United States every two years. And in 2002, we put in a measure of loneliness. In 2008, we looked at how many individuals had died during that interim. Now, this is the health and retirement study, so it's of older adults during that six-year period. There will, in fact, be significant numbers of individuals who will have died. And you can see we looked at demographic factors, and indeed, people who are older are more likely to die. That's not a shock to anyone. Men are more likely than women to die. Uh, poor people are more likely to die than rich people. Not a big surprise. These are what we'd expect. There's a large epidemiologic literature saying all of this. Well, it's important to show you that we also take these influences out, all right? And you see up here, loneliness in 2002 is significantly predicting who dies over that period. Well, what if we add in other social behavior, objective social circumstances? Notice it's not predicting anything, and it doesn't diminish the prediction of death by loneliness at all. Again, perceived being much more important than objective social environment. What about health behaviors? What if you put those in? Health behaviors are important predictors of morbidity and mortality. But notice that the prediction of loneliness, of death by loneliness, that ratio changes negligibly. So it's not that health behaviors aren't important. They're not mediating this effect. So the socioepidemiologists we're wrong in that suggestion. There's no evidence for social control hypothesis at, well, at all. So what is it? And in fact, you think about the animal data. I don't think the fruit flies are dying earlier because you know, their friends and relatives are telling them to go get exercise. 
it's, it's something more biologic, right? And so that's the story I'd like to, to kind of unfold a little bit with you. But I want to point out, these are big effects. What I have mapped here uh, are the effect sizes for morbidity and mortality from smoking, smoking cessation, alcohol consumption, flu vaccine, cardiac rehabilitation, physical activity. Here's BMI, here's obesity, the effect of obesity. Yes, it's dangerous. It's leading to an earlier death. Not as much as cigarettes, but it's leading to an earlier death. Drug treatment for hypertension, air pollution. All right? This was a meta-analysis done by Julianne holt Lundsted and Utah and colleagues. They also looked at social factors. Here's the effect, for instance, of isolation that we're talking about. These are big effects. Well, let's go back to the social brain. Your brain is tuned for social stimuli. It is a broadband, mobile, connected device. When you show a face or an eye, there's an area of your brain that loves eyes, looks out, searches for eyes. And when it sees eyes or a face, it lights up. Fusiform gyrus, back and bottom of the brain. Bilateral, it's very responsive. In fact, if you show it cars with a grill and headlights, it lights up. <laughs> it really, it's tuned to detect faces. This is electrophysiology, but basically I'm showing you how much of the brain juices up, if you will, gets excited and, and uh, starts paying attention when you're looking at a novel social stimulus and an equally arousing, uh, complex, uh, and similarly valence non-social stimulus. And what you can see just with your eyes is that the social stimulus, with everything else constant, attracts the brain's energy, attention, a lot more than the non-social. And I can mention that this was true whether you were paying any attention to the social stimulus at all. I was asking in this experiment questions having nothing to do with whether it was a social or non-social stimulus. And in terms of speed, this response starts in about 200 milliseconds. So it's very, very fast. Your brain is doing this without your attention or awareness. Interestingly, if you cooperate, you get activation of the same region of the brain that's involved if you eat a delicious meal, you have sex, or you're doing cocaine. Cooperation also uses that part of the brain. It's very rewarding. There's a recent study published in Journal of Neuroscience of mothers of rat pups, where they had already nursed the rat pup. That mother showed greater activation and a behavioral preference to nurse those rat pups in this area over cocaine. So that's how powerful these connections can be. Down here is just the opposite. This is social pain. When you look at physical pain and social pain, the same areas of your brain are activated. When you feel pained by someone, maybe a child who leaves for college, and you've had the child, curse that child perhaps over time for 18 years, and now they're leaving, the pain that you feel is represented in the brain as if you had, in fact, been kicked in the stomach including the sensory motor cortices. So we can, if you will, think about your brain along a continuum as its connections to other individuals, other brains flow along that continuum, from feeling isolated to feeling closely bonded to others. And you see all kinds of adjustments in brain activity and in behavior, in mentation. I mentioned that we, in uh, isolation, when the brain's in that state, you get reduced impulse control. The same is true of non-human animals. If you isolate a mouse or rat or a dog, and you look at their ability to control impulsive behavior, in animals we call it prepotent responses, the ability to regulate those prepotent responses is diminished when they're isolated. So we see remarkable consistency across species from these isolated conditions. Interestingly, in humans, if you feel isolated, you also, in the same room, if I asked you what's the temperature of this room right now, and you're sitting there in, within an estranged relationship versus a very warm, loving relationship, the ones in the estranged relationship will think it's colder in here. OK, so what is this perceived isolation? What are these aversive signals about? The pain and dysphoria of social isolation is an aversive biological signal, just like physical pain operating on, in fact, those physical pain systems. 
and it serves a similar function. Pain, physical pain is not a state I want any of you to be in, but I would never wish on any of you that you didn't have an operating physical pain system. People who do not have a physical pain system don't know when they're doing grave damage to their body. That system produces an aversive reaction that causes you to stop doing something that otherwise would place you in jeopardy. It's a functional system. Hunger, thirst, similar. Aversive signals that predate early enough the need to get food or water so that you get motivated to go find it so that you can survive. You need others. We are fundamentally social creatures. You need them to survive, to prosper, and for your genes to survive. Without them, you're very unlikely to have a genetic legacy. And social pain acts like physical pain. It protects that social body that is under threat or assault. One of the things it does is to also make you vigilant for assaults that threaten your short-term survival, what I called earlier predator evasion in non-human animals. And this is a good case in point. If you've ever been the last person picked on a sports team, I certainly have been, uh, or if you felt, you know, if you're sitting, if you're a Blazers fan and you're in the Lakers audience, and you happen to be in the middle of the Lakers fans, I mean, you're around other people, but predator evasion is certainly a relevant concern. You can feel, <laughs> you can feel isolated in that context, and you have to be wary of those around you. I mean, humans predate each other, so that's, that's a real concern. And this, your brain, whether you know it or not, your brain goes into a protection state, a self-preservational state of, of being. It also, of course, fosters this opportunity for reconnection with others necessary for your survival and your long-term survival of your genes. All right? So what does it feel like? I've told you a little bit about the brain. What is the mind doing? And we probe this. Now, notice I didn't say consciousness. I'm not saying what it is that, you know, if, you, if I asked you, what would you feel about it? But rather, what's the mind doing? So let me give you an example of what I mean. If I wanted to understand the structure, the mental representation of rooms. I might ask you, describe a room. And you could describe this room, a marvelous room if I've ever seen one. You might describe your study, your living room, your office, your bedroom, who knows? You might study, uh, describe any such room. And analyzing everyone's descriptions, what I would find is that rooms have height, width, depth, and stuff. And the stuff varies. But what's invariant are those three dimensions. That's basically the analysis that we did, looking at how do people, how do minds organize, if you will, represent relationships. And one of the dimensions we found was what we call intimate connection or isolation. These are the kinds of questions that we can ask you that tap this. I lack companionship, I feel left out, I feel isolated from others, I'm unhappy being so withdrawn. Gary Larson, always uh, insightful in science, has drawn cartoons that actually capture this. Here you have one where you've got Frankenstein here working with pre-designed couple. Hey, come on now, you two were made for each other. Right? So they're supposed to be connected, and for some reason they're not feeling so much. We looked at what are the predictors of where people fall along this continuum, and what we find is marital status. If you're married, you're more likely to be high on intimate connected than low. That spouse is likely to affirm your value as an individual. Now, don't get me wrong. People can be married and not have that kind of connection with that spouse. And in fact, that's more toxic than not being married at all. OK, the second dimension is relational. This is the one people actually think of when they think of things like isolation or loneliness. And it's all the face-to-face -face relationships. There are people who, to whom I feel close. There's people who really understand me. There's people to whom I can talk. Gary Larson's nailed it. You have these two individuals on an island. Thanks for being my friend, Wayne. They don't have to feel that way toward each other. If they do, high in relational connectedness. All right? Again, looking at what are the objective characteristics that actually predict where people fall on this, number of close friends and confidants uh, and family members with whom you've had an interaction over the last two weeks. I should mention this structure is true for men, for women, for young adults, for older adults, for African Americans, for Latino Americans, for Euro Americans, for Chinese citizens who are young in Beijing, and for the older generation in Beijing. So it seems to be a remarkably robust mental structure. The third and last dimension 
is feelings of collective connectedness. There's a couple of the items. This captures it pretty well. You've got two bears here. Well, we're lost, and it's probably just a matter of time before someone decides to shoot us. It is the pair of Blazer fans, friends as they are, in the Lakers, uh, what do they call it, Staple, uh, Staple Arena? Staple Center, thank you. Well, those of you who have ever been, I haven't, those of you who have ever been may f understand this. Another experience for collective connectedness is the experience in America right after 9-11. If you recall, that horrible assault on America led to a change in how we as Americans treated others who we had never met, strangers, people on the road. And in fact, people were treating each other so much better that it made national media news. Now, of course, admonitions that we watch our neighborhoods for nefarious people walking around, anyone who we didn't already know and call Homeland Security if we saw such people, cut that a little short. But what that was, was it made our collective identity, our national identity salient, and that actually then brought us together. That's the kind of connection that I'm talking about here. And indeed, if you look for what are the objective predictors of where you fall on this dimension, it's the number of group memberships uh, that you have as an older adult. Okay, let me just show you one of the principles I've, I've alluded a couple times to here is that your brain goes in a different state in isolation, in a self-preservational state, and you, one of the kind of insidious aspects is you don't know it. You're unaware of it. There is no conscious insight into this. How do I know? What's the evidence for that? Well, let me just give you three sources. This is the Stroop test. What I want you to do, and I'll just back this up, is to tell me what color all the letter strings are, are written in. Uh, you don't have to read the words. It's better not to read the words. Just tell me the color of the ink as I present them. Ready? Go. Blue. OK, so this is orange, but that's OK. It looks yellow, I admit, in the screen. But blue, orange, green, red. I want you to do it again. Same task, exactly identical uh, setting. Ready? Go. OK, your brain is doing something you don't even want it to do, but you can't stop it. It's reading these words, and you're not telling it to. And the only reason I can tell you, you now know it, is you felt the interference that was produced by that, all right? Well, we use this. We know your brain's going to read the words. Words that really matter, that relate closely to something that's important to your brain, are going to be the words that you're going to get stuck on. And it will be hard for you to name that color. And so we presented a list of words like this. Now notice, we have negative words. Some of them are social, some of them are non-social. We have positive words. Some of them are social, some of them are non-social. Many such words, equally long, equally frequent in the English language. And of course, we just have people go through and do the path that you just did. And what we find is the lonelier is our participant, the longer it takes them to name the color of the negative social words. Now, we find this, whether we bring them in and we measure their loneliness or how isolated they feel, or I experimentally, randomly assign them to become lonely or not. And we have nefarious ways of making people feel lonely. Now, we take it away. We make them feel lonely, then we take it away before we ever let them go away, right? But if I make you feel lonely temporarily, you get the same interference effect. Your brain is, if you will, in a different state. Well, we've also done brain imaging and same kind of logic. I'm going to show pictures that are negative, that are non-social, animals, but non-social, and negative social episodes. Those in the back, this is a man who uh, has a gun in the mouth of another person. All right? And then social and non-social positive pictures. Over all the pictures that we use, they're equally pleasant, they're equally arousing, they're equally colorful, they're equally complex. All right? And what we do is to contrast what is your brain doing when looking at this versus this picture, that contrast. I then took that hemodynamic response, that pattern of brain change, and I looked at how that pattern of brain change varied depending on your feeling of loneliness. If your brain is on alert, or excuse me, if your brain is feeling isolated, do we, feel, do we see evidence that it's also on alert for social threat? 
this is what we see. This is the back of the brain. The, that's the front of the brain. Your ears would be on these sides. And these orange spots here show greater activity the lonelier you feel. And what it's showing is that for a negative social and non-social picture, the negative social picture is causing greater visual activation. Now, your eyes are doing the same thing, whether you're lonely or non-lonely. It's your brain that's doing something different. If it's a negative social picture, your brain is, if you will, extracting more visual information from the arrays going through your eyes than if you're not lonely, if you don't feel isolated. That picture has greater relevance. If you're on the edge of a social group, anything negative in that social setting is a signal to you to be careful. As you follow that visual stream forward, you get to a bilateral area called the temporal parietal junction. And notice it's in blue. This temporal parietal junction is associated with theory of mind, empathy, and perspective taking. It's responsible for enabling you to take your attention outside of the brain in your cranial vault and, at least metaphorically, putting it inside the head of someone you are watching or care about. In this case, this poor person who's being intimidated or threatened by this man, or if you will, someone who might have had an accident in front of you, the non-lonely are showing greater activation in that region. To say it differently, if your brain is on alert for social threats, you have a negative social context, you're now concerned about self-preservation, somebody else is at risk, you're concerned about self-preservation, you take their perspective less. It's not that you can't, it's that you're the one in danger by your brain's assessment of the environment, right? Now, we did the same thing for positive. The story's quite different. This blue area, centered in the ventral striatum, this is a dopamine area of the brain, if you will, the reward area in the emotional brain, it's called the limbic lobe. And what we see is the less lonely you feel, the greater the reward activity, the joy you show in that brain in response to positive social pictures. If you feel lonely, you say this is just as positive a picture as if you don't feel isolated or lonely. But you don't feel, you, you don't feel as positive. Down here, we have experience sampling data that is beeping these people and asking them, are you in a positive or negative social context? How do you feel? What it shows is they're not actually in different circumstances. They believe, they feel they're in different circumstances. So these are the severity of hassles, lonely individuals, the same hassles. We actually know what the events were. They were the same hassles. They were more impactful, more stressful to the lonely than to the non-lonely. These are positive events. And happily, we all, in, even lonely individuals, have more positive than negative events. But notice the positive events are felt as being more positive. They enjoy them more than the lonely. Well, there's the evidence. Ventral striatum is underlying that greater joy that they're actually feeling. So they recognize that it's being equally positive, but they're not able to share that joy. Well, if it's, and this is the third source of evidence, that your brain's doing something quite profound of which you're unaware, and it's this. If it's dangerous to fend for yourself with a stick, fending off wild beasts, or trying to survive on your own, and I'm no Bear grills, I wouldn't last very long. Think about how dangerous it is to lay that stick down, to go to sleep by yourself without a safe social surround and predators out at night, all right? Social animals sleep in groups. Humans, for centuries, for thousands of years, slept in groups. We tested our subjects in hospital rooms, all isolated. Some felt lonely, some didn't feel lonely. What we find is that the lonelier that individual felt, the more sleep disturbance they showed. Now, they slept the same number of hours, but they showed micro-awakenings. They showed sleep fragmentation. And as a result, they awakened in the morning feeling fatigued and reporting that they had slept fewer hours. In fact, they slept the same amount of time. We measured that as well. They just felt that way in the morning because they felt so tired. Well, there's surveys you can do. When we went to our older adult sample and chasers, we only use that because of the response burden. And these are the young adults. And what you see is there's this clear effect of loneliness on sleep. 
it's less, it's poor quality. Notice in the older adults, we see exactly the same thing, but now it's even exaggerated. And my favorite, in young adults, they don't do sleep meds. Look at this, in older adults, the lonely individuals are actually taking more sleep meds as well, but it's not doing the trick. Oops, excuse me. This is to show that if we do longitudinal research, we find that loneliness is predicting how tired you feel the next day, how tired you feel the next day isn't predicting how lonely. And in this particular model, we're taking out depressive symptoms, perceived stress, hostility, and social support, as well as all the demographics that I showed you earlier. So this is specific to whether you feel isolated. Your brain, the reason I did this research is because how would you know if the brain is on alert and it has nothing to do with consciousness? Test them when they're asleep. And that's exactly what we're finding here. Now we did one other study. And it was of the Hutterites. And the reason I chose the Hutterites is because most of our studies are of kids or of adults in urban settings. The Hutterites do not live in urban settings. This is a, an agrarian a religious uh, group who lives in the Western United States, very isolated uh, communities, and as a group, the lowest levels of loneliness I've seen anywhere in the world. We used wrist actigraphy so we could actually measure Sleep fragmentation objectively in this group, as we had in the young adults in a study I showed you earlier. And what we see is that net all these other factors, loneliness is predicting whether they have fragmented sleep. The lonelier, and it, remember, these are low levels of loneliness or very low levels of loneliness. Even that small range, we're able to detect decreased sleep efficiency, increased sleep fragmentation, the lonelier they feel. Well, we're getting a little late, so I'm not going to go through the neuroendocrine results uh, or these genetic results. I'll be happy to answer questions about them. Instead, what I'd like to do is to spend a little more time in Q&A with you, but I'd like to just draw a parallel. 500 years ago, standing on the Earth and looking up, it certainly looked like we were the center of the universe. I mean, if you do it today and you look up, it strikes me as all the stars are circling us, Right? So one can understand that perspective. But and this is from Daniel Bornstein's uh, The Discoverers, a kind of a, a lay history of science book. He observed that nothing could be more obvious that the Earth is stable and the unmoving and that we're at the center. Modern Western science takes its beginning from the denial of this common sense axiom. Common sense, the foundation of everyday life, could no longer serve for the governance of the world. When the scientific knowledge, the sophisticated product of complicated instruments and subtle calculations provided unimpeachable truths, things were no longer as they seemed. Well, I draw that parallel because our brain is housed deep within our cranial vault with orbits out front looking out at the rest of our social world. And it certainly seems like we're independent of all that we see moving around us and that we're solitary as an individual. But in fact, our brains and our minds are connected in fundamental ways. And we see this in everyday discourse. And we see it as we look at structure and function inside the brain. And that's something I think that I hope you will, will consider as you go through your daily lives. And be curious about the difference between what you think, what you feel, and what your brain is actually doing, and perhaps understand uh, more about why that brain is out there connecting to all the other brains around you. Thank you very much. Okay. Good. Hi. Hi. Uh, how much human interaction can be replaced by pets? and by online uh, social network? Very good question. We've looked at both of those. Um, so we've looked at the pet ownership. Uh, Chicago's an unusual place. Uh, there's a lot of reptiles and, and small mammals there. But there's you know, a, a number of uh, dog and cat owners. Uh, I'm going to say something that I'm sure may be disappointing to some. Dogs actually serve as a good substitute. Uh, somebody in DC said, if you want a friend in DC, buy a dog. They were right. Uh, cats don't seem to replace others. Dogs seem to replace others a little bit. Um, as to the online question, this was a recent article in the Atlantic uh, magazine 
Uh, and the answer to this is yes and no. Uh, Facebook, social networking sites, computer mediated interactions are a little bit like a car. It's not the car that makes you feel lonely or non-lonely, it's how do you use the car. If you use the car to drive to your friends or family, it makes you less lonely. If you use it to drive around just by yourself, it's likely to make you more lonely. We did a study. So what the, what the literature shows is that uh, the more friends you have on Facebook, the less lonely you are. And that's been used to say we're being connected differently, we're in a new era, and that's going to solve our problems of, of lack of connection and more isolated living. Here's what the data show. You're making those friends offline. You're making them face to face. And when you go on Facebook, you friend them on Facebook. All right? So what we did was to look at how many interactions, what proportion of your interactions are you having with friends and family face to face? And the more interactions you're having face to face, the less lonely you are. And we asked the same question. What's the proportion of your interactions with these people are you having online? on social networking sites, and that's primarily Facebook, on chat rooms, gaming sites, or dating sites. These are the data. All of them, the greater the proportion you're having online, the lonelier you are. It's, it's a little bit like eating celery when you're hungry. It feels good, right? It feels satisfying. It has no nutritional value whatsoever, and ultimately you will starve. So if you're using Facebook as a means of connecting with other people, staying up with your old friends back home so that when you go back home, you haven't severed any of those friendships, it increases. As long as you have those interactions, it increases your connection. When it's used as an excuse not to go out and make new friends, it in fact fosters loneliness. So it's how you use the tool. The tool isn't the problem, it's the fact that we sometimes use it wrong. And I think in some ways technology or the technology fields are just expounding the virtues of technology but without saying, well, but you've got to use it in a careful fashion or in a productive fashion. There's a way to use it that's counterproductive as well. And so that's what we found uh, in terms of the internet. I think you're next and then you and then we'll go back over to you, okay? Go ahead, please. So the U.S. has the largest percentage of its population in prisons, and a fair number of those prisons use um, social isolation as one of the methods yes. for control. Yes. And so I was just curious, have you been able to do any research about the effect of those kinds of situations on the human brain and what it means for those who are being released from those um, places and back into, supposedly, our society? Yes, that's a very good question. The answer to the question, the simple answer is no. Uh, the, the secondary answer is I've asked and was told no. Uh, the third answer is it's a complicated question. In fact, the place that I asked was Colorado because unlike other states, Colorado has a lot of prisoners in solitary confinement. 15% of its prison population is in solitary confinement. That's a very large number. Now, what I didn't bother to show you was loneliness is about 50% heritable. And what's being inherited is not feeling lonely. It's not the feeling of isolation. It's how painful is it when you are disconnected. And just like physical pain, we differ in how painful that social disconnection will be. Some people, it's not very painful. That's good, in a sense, for a, for a population. You want some individuals who aren't so pained by dis disconnected that they're willing to go over hills to see what's on the other side, to be explorers. You want some pain for disconnection so they come back. Because if they never bother to come back, the population doesn't learn what's on the other side of that hill. But having a little bit allows you to have explorers among your set. You also want people who are greatly pained because they're the ones who are willing to stand up and defend even against odds because the thought of losing others close to them is even worse as a possible future. All right? So that natural variation is what we see. Just as in anything with natural variation, you have extremes. And I've talked to experts in psychopathy. There's a growing consensus that people in this normal distribution who have no pain at disconnection aren't as likely to be rewarded or pained by those social interactions, then look at others as instruments of behavior, instruments for their own satisfaction. They're psychopaths. And psychopaths are overrepresented in prison populations. And so the, I'm, 
it's a little difficult to know what one might expect, and identifying psychopaths is not the easiest task because they're not particularly likely to give you honest answers. So the prison population creates some problems, but in Colorado, that's such a high percentage, I don't think we would be uh, uh, as subjected to that particular problem. However, I have been thinking of alternatives, scientists that work in the Antarctic, or perhaps as NASA thinks about sending uh, manned spacecraft to Mars, certainly one of the things you're gonna have to deal with is isolation, and so I'm at least starting to think about approaching NASA with, with such a project. There, you'd have healthy astronauts or astronauts-to-be who would uh, voluntarily go into isolated conditions for long periods. And so that's a possible way to get at that question. Go ahead, please. Hi there. Um, I'm interested in different behavioral responses to daily experiences of loneliness. And you had just mentioned that um, to those who are more socially connected, the experience of being by oneself is actually quite very healthy. And I'm wondering if, um, the experience of solitude can actually be an effective response to loneliness, or if you think for those people who are more connected or they perceive that they have greater support available on one day when they're particularly lonely, yeah. if that experience of solitude could be effective. Well, solitude is the peacefulness and happiness of being alone, and loneliness is the pain of being alone. But one, you know, your question about having others around that are supportive, there's a very large literature on social support. And I, in fact, 25 years ago, studied social support. I fell into research on isolation through the means I, I specified. But uh, I thought it would be explained by social support. And we didn't find that, and others since then haven't found it. And the reason is to be the one who's receiving support puts you in a position where it's a little pathetic. And you feel a little pathetic. You feel a little needy. You don't really feel like you have a connection that's shared. It's not a kind of positive experience. One of the best ways to, in fact, feel, build those relationships is called capitalization. Fancy term. What it means is to share positive experiences. Think about if you were in a high school or college or town, the Blazers are going for the NBA championship, you're a strong Blazers fan, how exciting that is, and how, if you will, collectively uh, enjoy that is. So if you have a spouse who enjoys that, or a city or a workplace that enjoys it, it brings that group together, and after the event, that bond remains strong. So that's actually a much better way, if someone has a temporary feeling of loneliness, to try to bring them together, go out and do something that's mutually beneficial, that's mutually enjoyed, and that builds a better reservoir for that person than going to them and seeing if they need anything and trying to help them. Great, thank you. Yes, of course. Yes, please. Yeah, uh, considering it's some, some of the early, or, or the data that you took uh, on a base level, the bilateral nature of the brain, um, was it, did you ever do any correlations between binocular versus monocular vision and if that had any effect, since that's your primary portals going back to all the receptors and calculators yeah. and et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, no, we haven't. We haven't, we haven't looked at, well, I tell you back, one of the studies I did um, almost 20 years ago now, we did dichotic listening. That's not the same as you're asking, but we did do dichotic listening. Uh, and we looked at whether it was in the dominant ear, the non-dominant ear. The idea is that it, you're listening to consonant vowel consonants. They have to identify the consonant vowel consonant combinations. And uh, if it's in the, the dominant ear, this is fairly easy because that's the default. Lonely and non-lonely do equally well at that. It's when you put it in the non-dominant ear, when it's not the prepotent response. When you do that, lonely individuals do more poorly at that. But again, that's a measure of executive function, of impulse control, of prepotent responses. And loneliness impairs the ability to um, inhibit prepotent responses. And so that's what we found in that particular, at least that's how, I, that's how I interpreted our findings in that study. Yes? All right, so earlier you talked about the man who took uh, a blow to his orbital frontal cortex and how it dramatically changed his social behavior for the rest yes. of his life. Yes. So how does PTSD fit in the same thing where you don't take a, a physical um, blow to your brain, but it does kind of similar things to where it changes social behavior, and is it repairable, or is it kind of the same way as you can't, like you can't repair brain cells or brain matter, but people that suffer from PTSD, which a lot of Americans do today, especially with the war and whatnot, like, are they curable, or 
is it the same kind of instance that yeah. it's just something you have to live with? The, well, that's, there's, a, there's different views on PTSD. Um, one of the things that recent research in the Army has shown is that uh, the same traumatic event, if it occurs in the first six months and you're removed from the setting, you're much less likely to develop PTSD than if you remain in the, the war theater. And so it has to do not only with the event, but the context and the duration in which you're in that uncertain context, it seems. Um, in terms of reparation, I know most of us have hope. There are cases and treatments that improve PTSD. Uh, it's not the same as a brain lesion. Uh, you're not going to replace the orbital frontal cortex and Phineas gauge. PTSD, there is some hope that we can desensitize or decondition the response that's been overgeneralized uh, in those cases. Uh, one of the things we're now doing is we're working with the Army, uh, trying to train these soldiers before they get deployed. And we're trying to build social resilience, that is, the kinds of connections that I've alluded to here, teaching them in many ways social skills uh, and the importance of social connections, how to uh, talk to one another, understand one another, uh, recognize uh, how someone's feeling changes in behavior when they might start feeling isolated, what to do if they're in that kind of case, capitalization, as I, as I alluded to, the importance of those kinds of bonds. Uh, and the hope is that those will place these soldiers in those traumatic circumstances in a position to come back with less damage. Uh, what I can say is we've been to Fort Bliss, Fort Lewis, and Fort Sill, and we have fairly effective training after those experiences. The next, uh, the next iteration will be uh, in the fall, we'll train two brigades who will then be deployed to Afghanistan. And so I'll know more in a year whether we can actually do something. But our hope is to, rather than try to treat it after the fact, improve their circumstances so they're less likely to come back with PTSD. Right, but I mean, is there a way that it's possible to actually prepare people for seeing, like, for instance, like seeing their friend, so yeah. they be yeah. like killed in front of them, or to have to do, you know, the opposite of like killing them? Is there, is there even a way to condition your brain to see that and like, I guess, not be bothered by it? Because otherwise you'd be kind of a sick person, I guess. Like if you right. see those kind of things and then you're just like, oh, well, it's a Monday. You know yeah, I mean? yeah. Like, I don't think the issue will be to, there, there are things you can do to prepare people for such events. Um, that's not to say that they're not going to care. Uh, I think in some ways, this, this whole story about these connected brains is really the story of our humanity. I don't know that I would want a soldier to not care if they had a best friend who was, you know, killed horribly in front of them. Um, but what we can do is to help them recover. And that's really what resilience is about, is not so much trying to make them insensitive to the event. In fact, trying to make them insensitive is counterproductive. Um, but to accept that it will be painful and that pain will take a while to heal, but they don't have to heal alone. And that's really the important part. Remember as a child when he fell and he looked around and just having a loving parent there helped that pain go away a little more quickly. Now that's simplifying it, but it's somewhere along those lines that it's a very traumatic experience, it's very painful, it's gonna take a while. But doing it alone is not as likely to lead to a positive outcome as doing it with the assistance of others. And in fact, the preliminary data say that's the case. But the strong test hasn't been done. That's what's something we hope to do in the next year or two. Thanks. Thank you. Yes. Um, have you done these uh studies on loneliness with people with social disorders like, such as autism? And did the, your um, disorders ha appear to have an, a certain effect on their loneliness? Yeah, it's a very good question. We have not. I, I mentioned earlier that we've done population-based research because I've wanted to understand who we, are as, who we are as a species and where we fit within the biology of life. However, I have spoken to, at enough venues where people with uh, autistic spectrum disorder have approached me and talked to me about it. And you know, it was interesting um, that people with autistic spectrum disorder uh, experience loneliness. Uh, one thing that is true, and, I, and it was true of the individuals to whom I was speaking, um, eye contact is painful. Eye contact is aversive. And when you don't have eye contact in a normal social interaction, you're missing a lot of cues. And that makes the interaction itself a little uncomfortable 
for individuals who are used to having eye contact and interacting, which makes it aversive to interact with such individuals, which makes us more likely to treat such individuals in a negative fashion. And th that is certainly something picked up by s those individuals. And so I asked the individual if there were others with whom he actually had something of a relationship, and he described two other individuals who sounded to be um, uh, similarly disposed socially. So I think there's some uh, hope to try to bring such individuals together and then try to work through those kinds of interactions. But it's not an area in which I have actually worked. Okay, and um, this is sort of off topic, but sure. do you, have you studied what causes autism? No, uh, no, I haven't. There are experts working on that. I'm not one of them. Oh, okay. It is complexly determined, that much we know, but the exact cause is a very hot area of research right now. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, my question is about antisocial behavior and violent behavior. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to frame it in sort of the age-old question about free will versus determinism. Mm -hmm. We've talked a little bit about damage or maybe how strokes, um, Alzheimer's, cocaine use could damage someone's brain and change their personality. Mm -hmm. It is said that in the modern day, things that used to be sins, like gluttony and, um, and alcoholism, I mean, you know, gluttony and over drinking are now turned into medical diseases, sort of blamed on um, maybe some genetic predisposition. So in cases like um, Professor Amy Bishop, who, you know, someone who was denied tenure and erupted in what seemed like very shocking violence, in cases like those, to what extent do you think um, it's antisocial behavior that we could detect if we had, you know, perfect brain scans, and um, it's antisocial behavior that's caused by physiological changes, and to what extent is it, you know, do you still think free will and all those things still apply? That's a really complicated question. I, I mean, <laughs> and I'm going to give you a relatively, I'll, I'll apologize if, at the beginning, I'll give you a relatively simple answer, and the reason is because it's such an inviting question, it, it, it's a whole different lecture, and one in which I'd love to engage someday, but tonight's probably not the time. But violent behavior is complexly determined. It doesn't have a single cause. It isn't due to a particular area of the brain. It isn't necessarily due to any damage of the brain. Some violence is from the enjoyment of the individual. They're doing it because it's fun. Sometimes it's because they want something another person has and they need it direly, or at least they feel they need it direly. There's many, sometimes it's because of social pressure. You know, we sometimes drink because we're thirsty. Sometimes we drink because others around us are drinking. So there's biological influences, there's these social influences on aggression, just as there are on simple behaviors like drinking. If we had a perfect brain scan, we wouldn't know what we were looking for. If we knew what we were looking for, it would be these brain anomalies are sufficiently low in base rate that it would, be hot, it would be hard to not have a lot of false alarms. That is, we would identify somebody who might be at risk for that, but in fact, you would learn to control it. And so those are all complicated uh, aspects of the question that you've asked. Would we have free will? Well, Patricia Churchland, neurophilosopher, has argued that we have no free will. It's just a perception of free will. But even though we don't have free will, that we have to hold individuals who engage in antisocial behavior responsible, because if we didn't, then all of society would crumble. And although I actually disagree with her on the first part of that statement, I do agree with her on the second part. And so that's not a completely satisfactory. I certainly think we need to treat differently those who, have, by disease or brain damage, engage that we can de demonstrate that engage in a behavior versus one who from what we can tell, has all the neural machinery to have exerted self-control but chose not to, or at least didn't in that particular case. Those two kinds of cases strike me as appropriate to treat differently. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Um, you mentioned that one of the um, correlations that comes with loneliness is uh, less of an ability to control impulses. So, I was one, and, and then you showed also this, this graph where you show certain, I'm not so, I'm not sure how popular, uh, uses of uh, social media to engage in activities that increase loneliness, uh, that, you know, 
the how, sorry, how some certain activities that are somewhat at least popular in social media cause a higher loneliness. Mm -hmm. So um, I was wondering if you have any comments as to how those two fit, fit together with the introduction of ads in that context, and also if um, you're aware of some other examples of activities we typically engage in that drive up loneliness but are not as obvious to the casual observer. Thank you. Sure. The, um, let's see if I can pull this back up. So notice that some users of Facebook down here are, are not lonely as a result of using Facebook, right? So the question is, why are these people using it so much? And in, at least in some of these cases, this is not our research, it's the research of some others, some individuals when they get lonely uh, have had bad experiences socially, and so they become distrustful, and they find I'm not going to go out and exert the effort to meet people anymore, it always goes bad, instead I'll sit in a safe distance behind my computer and have those interactions. That's the kind of eating celery, it feels better than the imagined alternative. And you know, they're not going to overcome their feeling of isolation with that. And one of the other things that we find is as they start to present themselves, behind the computer, you don't have to present an authentic self. Uh, evidently, if you're CEO at Yahoo, you don't have to present an authentic <laughs> self. But the extent to which you're presenting a non-authentic self, the loneliness is greater, and you can see why. I mean, if it is weakly reinforcing, to have your actual self accepted in an online uh, conversation. Imagine how pathetic it is to not feel like you can present your honest self, but instead you have to present some false self uh, to get that kind of positive interaction. And so you can see where the more non-authentic you get, uh, the, the more isolating from your actual self you tend to be. And so that's, that's an example of where they're not exerting the control of the impulse to avoid those more effortful social relationships, and indeed there is the danger of actually being rejected or you know, having that negative social interaction. But if one tries and tries again, and I often say do volunteer service. Uh, that, that's something that uh, takes a little bit of executive functioning and they're not in a particularly high mood to do. So one of the non-obvious is this uh, presentation of non-authentic selves. One of the non-obvious ways to mitigate it in social interactions when you feel lonely, you want, you know, you hunger for social contact. And if you've ever talked to an individual when they felt lonely, and I say it that way because this is something all of us can be in. When they felt lonely, you, if you've been in a cocktail party, they are, want to eat you alive. It's kind of what you feel like, right? I'm being eaten alive by this person. And so you try to disengage, get away, and it's hard to, right? You have to understand that as a lonely, when one feels isolated, that that's what your brain is doing. And relationships take both people to get something out of it. It's not enough for you to be able to talk. Both people have to be able to get something out of it. And so it's not so much about eating others as feeding others or eating together with others. And so a, a nice way to kind of safely extend yourself from behind the computer out and get interactions with others is to do volunteer service. If you're serving soup to people who need food, it's hard to find anything but positive reactions from those you're helping. And that kind of activity starts to, if you will, remove this, the brain's wariness about the interactions always going bad. And so that's kind of a non-obvious mitigator, if you will. Okay. Thank you. Yes, please. Hi. Um, I had a question, of, I have a couple questions, but about the rat study you did? Yes. Were the rats born in isolation? Or no, no. Thank were, you they, were they in a group and then taken? Yeah, these are studies, actually most of those animal studies are by individuals in the literature, different scientists. Uh, the, the mouse study on the stroke was done uh, by a, a postdoc of mine before he came to my lab. Um, but these are animals that are raised often past weaning. And now that they've been weaned, uh, like with the mouse, they were isolated for just two weeks. That's all it takes. Shorter than that, you get a smaller effect. Uh, and they were either mouse, uh, housed with a, another uh, cage mate or they were housed alone. And so it only takes a couple of weeks for a social animal to start to feel that. We now have a monkey model of this, and we're talking about about three to four weeks to get any physiological effect that we're interested in. 
So the reason I ask. So, so the reason I ask is because uh, is it possible that the negative, basically uh, all the points you made that and the conclusions you made were that being isolated is an, has a negative effect upon the animal's life. Usually, health effects, it's negative usually. Yes. Yes. Um, is it possible that this is because of a sort of a programming and influence of society that being alone is uh, a bad thing or it's weird? Or uh, is, could that be because society sort of programs you into thinking that, you know, being alone is wrong rather than if you were, oh, became aware of this, you could, you know, step back and uh, reverse these effects and, and not, or, or, or are you saying that it's biologically bad for an animal to be alone? So let, I'm glad you raised the question. I do think that culture, our culture, has made it odd to be alone. And that's one of the things I'd like to emphasize is being alone is actually can be a very good thing. It's a little bit like the internet. It's how are you using that time? If you're using it because you're alone, but you don't actually want to be alone. Our monkey model that I mentioned, there are animals who are alone, and they seem perfectly pleased to be alone. There's others who walk toward Within arm's distance of other monkeys, and an arm's distance is a dangerous space because the monkeys can grab you, within that dangerous space, so they put themselves in a vulnerable position and then walk away, toward and away. Those are monkeys who are not happy. And in fact, they look like our lonely humans. So it's not about being alone, it's for what reasons are you alone, how are you using it? Having said that, the animal studies, these mice, there's no social influence on being alone that's getting stigmatized. It's making them show those responses. That's why the animal literature is so important to us, because we can rule out a lot of these other very important social influences. So, you're, so you think that uh, the, the negative effects of loneliness are because of the influence of society mainly? No, 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 I'm sorry. I think that in fact, due to uh, similarities across the species, that our brain goes on alert when we're on the social perimeter, just like it does in a mouse, in a rat, in a, in a cockroach. Cockroach is when they're isolated, they display what in the literature is called the isolation syndrome. And it's many of the same things we've been talking about tonight we see in humans. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Last round of questions, please. You okay. next. I, you had mentioned the, uh, the genetic contribution to uh, the dysphoria uh, attached to um, uh, social isolation, and I was wondering whether anybody had also um, looked in various ways at uh, the effects of adverse early experience on later perceptions, like whether had anybody had looked at attachment classification and its relationship to perceived dysphoria attached to social yeah. isolation. Yeah, we've looked at that a little bit. Uh, and one of the things about attachment processes is um, if you look at the extremes, then you see an effect. But when you're looking at a large population-based sample, those extremes are exactly that. They're statistically not very common. And so as a whole, it's not accounting for um, the loneliness effects that I've been talking about. But that doesn't mean that if you aren't in an extreme uh, neglect circumstance or abuse circumstance as a child, that there aren't long-term shadows cast by that early attachment problem. Uh, you mentioned that you've done this research with a lot of different groups in, you know, Beijing and this rural community and, and these different places. And I wonder if uh, there's been any accounting for the type of work that people do, not in the sense of, you know, whether whether they work alone or in groups, but rather the the uh, extent to which their labor is connected to the the product of the labor, uh, and how that has affected perceived loneliness? Yeah, what we have, that's a good question, what we have looked at is socioeconomic status, income, educational level, uh, not occupation per se, but those other factors, and what we find is that it's surprisingly not related to, to loneliness or felt isolation. In fact, among some of the more isolated feeling individuals are billionaires, and the reason is because there's lots of people who want to be their friends. But they're not convinced anyone to actually be their friends for them, but rather for their money. You know, I was always puzzled, why do these star athletes who come from such underprivileged backgrounds maintain these friends with these nefarious characters, right? It only gets them in trouble. Well, the reason seems to be the same as with the billionaires, because as this famous rich athlete, there's lots of people who would like to be their friend. 
the friendships that they can trust are those that they had in the hood before they gained that popularity. And so I think there's something too, kind of, it's partly the reason why popularity and loneliness are not as kind of negatively correlated as one might expect. So these different jobs I don't think are mapping in. Uh, people choose them to jobs for other reasons besides connection. And you know, your introverts are more likely to be working behind a desk with little uh, contact with others. The extrovert's going to be out there perhaps more likely to be a salesman. So we sort into things that fit our social needs is what it seems to be. Now, having said that, one thing I would predict, and we in some ways see, we haven't done it by occupation, but if you move a lot, if you're changing residences a lot, changing communities a lot, that does predict higher levels of loneliness, and you can imagine why that would be the case. Okay, thank you. Last question? Yes. Um, so let me get this straight, that an extrovert is somebody who is more sensitive to isolation. No, sorry. An extrovert? No, an extrovert is someone who likes a lot of social contact, has high social need. An introvert is someone who doesn't have a lot right, of so social Right, so an extrovert need. is more sensitive in the feeling of loneliness. No, to... no. Because they have a lot of social need, they, they want a lot of friends. But they're out there making a lot of friends as well. So the introvert is actually the one who's more likely to be lonely than the extrovert, because they're not out there making those friendships. But if you were to take an extrovert and you were to put them in solitary confinement, they would feel a more heightened effect from that treatment. Yes, they may. In that case, they may, because they are, if you will, hungrier for that contact than the introvert. But, there's a, but orthogonal to that is the extrovert and the introvert could be equally pained by a, a loss of an important friendship or an important relationship. Depending or they on could the vary. weight of that relationship. Right, right. That's very interesting. Um, so your work seems to be pointing towards genetic factors that make certain people more extroverted or introverted. Mm -hmm. um, what's the current work in that field? And uh, what are, can you summarize your findings about fundamental genetic factors that, that are involved in this? Well, yes, some. We've looked at heritability, which are the influence of genetics on loneliness. Now, extroversion and introversion, it's a different set of genes than the ones operating on loneliness, but there are, in fact, uh, genetic bases. It's about 50%. Um, but that leaves a lot of variance for the social world as well. So things like the extent to which, you know, as a child you got moved around and had to change schools, well, that's going to contribute to your level of loneliness as a child, for instance. Biologic factors, heritability uh, is a measure of individual differences that are due to genetics. So the heritability of having a heart is zero. It's not one, it's zero. It doesn't account for any individual variation. There's nobody alive who doesn't have a heart. They may metaphorically not have a heart, but they all actually have a heart. All right? And so that's, you know, heritability and the genetic influences can vary depending on uh, the context. So you think it's about half and half? It's half, well, our data show it's half and half in adults. It's a little less heritable when you're a child, and that's because there's more environmental variance. Your family's playing a big role as a child, not so much as an adult. Thank you. Thank you.